Moscow's Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Today's Velshi Band Book Club feature Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward begins with a birth. 15-year-old Esh, her brother Skeeta Randall Jr. and their father watch in a small dilapidated shed as China, Skeeta's white pit bull, delivers puppies for the first time. One comes into the world already dead. Five, five of them are fragile. They're born fighting. This moment, masterfully written over the course of an entire chapter, introduces themes that we're going to see again and again. The thin line between life and death, the intricacies of family dynamics, the all-encompassing restriction of racialized poverty, and the complexities of love. Set in the 12 days leading up to and just after Hurricane Katrina makes landfall, Salvage the Bones is broken down into vignettes that read as complete stories of their own. Every chapter is a single day as told to us by our Esh, our teenage protagonist. We join her as she and Randall steal crucial supplies for their family. We join her as she tries to save China's puppies from the deadly floodwaters. And we join her as she discovers that she's pregnant. Quote, I look at the stick, remember what it said on the packaging at the store. Two lines means you are pregnant, you are pregnant. I sit up and curl over my knees, rub my eyes against my kneecaps. The terrible truth of what I am flares like a dry fall fire in my stomach, eating all the fallen pine needles." End quote. Esh bucks whatever notion you may have of a pregnant teenage protagonist. Esh is commanding of her sexuality, sensitive. She re readily draws comparisons between her life and the Greek mythology that she's been assigned for school. Quote, in every one of the Greek mythology tales, there is this, a man chasing a woman or a woman chasing a man. There's never a meeting in the middle. There's only a body in a ditch, only one person walking toward it or away from it, end quote. While Savage the Bones is at its core a, store chronic, a story chronicling the lives of an impoverished family in the American South, it's also a story about discovering love. Rejected by Manny, the father of her child, abandoned by a mother dead from childbirth, and without a present father, Esh has little basis for understanding love. The most constant and honest example of love and devotion is between Skeeta and his pit bull, China. The book's most tender and striking scenes are between Skeeta and China. They are a true partnership. Even when Skeeta subjects China to brutal violence in a dogfight ring, they appear as a team, both victims of their circumstance. Skeeta whispers in her ear, quote, China, make them know even though they want to, they can't live without you, China. They walk together out of the ring. Once you finally finish Salvage the Bones, it's entirely clear why it won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2011. The rich imagery, the nuanced characters, and Ward's amazing ability to poetically depict beauty and gore almost interchangeably make for a book that is nothing short of a modern classic. This book changes you. And finally, 
I have a message for the two parents who lodged a formal complaint against a teacher in Guilford County, North Carolina, for assigning this book to her AP English class. And for anyone else targeting this book in classrooms around the nation, I urge you to read it cover to cover, calling Salvage the Bones, quote, trash, garbage, and pornography, end quote, like those two parents did, proves to me they didn't read it. We featured nearly 70 books on the Velshi Band Book Club, and there are few that are as compelling, as thought-provoking as this one. This is the sort of literature that should be assigned to every English class in America. Discuss Esh's family dynamic, pick apart the writing, examine the allusions to nature, and decide what survival looks like. You will be better for it. I know I am. I'm joined now by Jasmine Ward, the only woman and the only black person to win the National Book Award for Fiction twice. She is the author of numerous all-important books, including today's Velshi Band Book Club feature, Salvage the Bones. Jasmine, thank you for writing the book and thank you for uh, being with us this morning. Thank you all for having me. I want to start with the depiction of motherhood in Salvage the Bones. Esha's mother dies in childbirth. Esha's own pregnancy is met with rejection from the father. And then there's the moment I was talking about with China when she kills one of her own puppies. Quote, China is a bloody mouth, bright eyed as Medea. If she could speak, this is what I could ask her. Is this what motherhood is? End quote. Talk to me about this. Um, you know, much of the book is uh, spent, you know, all of the book is told from Esh's point of view, right? And so throughout the entire book, she's trying to figure out what it means to be a mother because unfortunately, as you mentioned earlier, she doesn't have any models for it, right? So she has to look for models of motherhood in uh, un uh, unlikely places. Uh, one of the... Uh, one of the models that she looks to is she looks to China, right? Um, she also looks to the myth of Medea, right? Um, and in the end of the, or near the end of the book, uh, she realizes, like she begins to look at uh, the hurricane, uh, which is Hurricane Katrina, as sort of a model of a type of, uh, of mother. I know that sounds strange, but so she has to, uh, you know, she has to look to unfamiliar, um, you know, unfamiliar things uh, to figure out like what it means to figure out what it means to care for something else um, uh, and in a in a brutal world. Right. And she sort of learns that um, that unfortunately, sometimes caregivers can be brutal. Right. Sometimes caregivers can fail those that uh, that they're supposed to care for even though they love them um, so she she I think she learns a lot of complicated um, lessons about love from these unlikely sources there is Greek mythology Greek mythology through line uh, throughout the book you just mentioned the story of uh, uh, Medea why, why this story as a vehicle uh, because I, <laughs> I'm going to offer an unsatisfying answer to that question. Um, I happened to have Edith Hamilton's mythology on my desk at the time that I was writing the rough draft of Salvage the Bones. And I have always loved that book since I was like 12 years old. And I wanted Esh to have, um, to have a source, you know, something outside of herself that she could reference and that she could read. And I looked at that book and I thought, well, why can't she read Edith Hamilton's mythology? Um, and so as I was writing Esh's story and as Esh was reading Edith Hamilton's mythology, I was also reading it at the same time. And so when I got to the part, when I got, when I read, uh, when I happened upon the tale of Jason and the Argonauts, that's when Esh happened upon the tale of Jason and the Argonauts. And it just clicked in that moment, right? It just seems to me right that Esh would, you know, like stop there and t and pay attention to that tale because it's so different from all the tales that come before it. Uh, Salvage the Bones and two of your other novels, Sing Unburied Sing and Where the Line Bleeds, take place in the fictional town of Bois Sauvage. You've said before that it's based on your hometown and where you're raising your family now. Tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's Bois Sauvage is a, 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 a fictionalized version of my hometown, which is uh, DeLille, Mississippi. It's a small rural town on the Mississippi Gulf Coast um, that where, you know, I grew up um, in a way. I don't think that a lot of people grow up. Uh, they don't have that opportunity anymore. I mean, I was I was very firmly rooted in a large community, a large black community. Um, uh, a, a, a core, you know, sort of family, a very, very large extended uh, family. I have over 200 people in my extended family. So there are a lot of us. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, like that's what um, I think keeps me there and makes me committed to, you know, living in the place that inspires me because I'm so firmly rooted in my family and in my community. Um, and also, I, you know, the, the, the landscape is very beautiful to me. The place is very beautiful to me. Uh, and so, you know, that's what that's what draws me there and keeps me there. You included three quotes in your epigraph. One is from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. One is from the poet Gloria Fuertes and one is from the Atlanta hip hop group Outcast. The last one reads, we on our back staring at the stars above talking about what we got to be when we grow up. I said, what you want to be? She said, alive. What's the significance of that? I am. Um, I love, uh, you know, Southern rap. Um, I love Outkast. I'm a huge Outkast fan. And, uh, and I, you know, because I feel like Southern rap and music uh, was so um, necessary and instrumental to my life when I was growing up and informed so much of my ideas about myself and and the world that I was moving through and what was possible and gave me keys to understand that world I wanted to reference southern rap in you know the beginning of the book in in one of the epigraphs and I was listening to Outkast and uh and you know of course Andre G3000 like raps those lyrics and I thought this is perfect right I mean it, it was such a I think um, an expression of what I would, what I think Esh and what I would be struggling with in in the book, right? I mean, you know, what these characters want more than anything is they want to live, they want to survive, they want to tell their stories, um, they want they want witness, uh, and so I think that 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 epigraph expresses that. Uh, Jasmine, amazing. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on the Velshi Band Book Club. Thank you for writing this amazing book. Thank you for sharing. I mean, we can go on for an hour uh, with all the great parts about this book, but I really appreciate having you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jasmine Ward is the uh, two-time uh, two winner of the National Book Award for Fiction, the author of uh, Salvage the Bones and many other books, including Let Us Descend. It is Monday. The 15th of January of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, River City Hash Mondays on this fabulous Martin Luther King Day. And, uh, yeah, the right wing MAGA has already uh, begun appropriating Martin Luther King quotes for their own nefarious designs. And uh, all I got to say is if they, if they say content of your character one more time, it's going to be over. I, it will be over. Yes, it makes me quite angry. Looks like also uh, Elon Musk is on another tear this morning, blaming diversity, equity, and inclusion for a door plug blowing out of a 737 Max. I, I, how is that possible? <laughs> I'll tell you how, because the guy's a bigot. He's apartheid Clyde, a blood emerald heir. Okay, the guy's a bigot. Because the reason that door plug blew out was not because of women pilots, not because of black pilots, not because of Hispanic pilots, not because of Asian pilots, not because of disabled pilots. 
That door plug blew out because anti-union, mm-hmm, anti-regulation, mm-hmm, hedge fund managers who run Boeing outsourced the door plug, or actually the whole fuselage, to a demonstrably shitty company. A company that had already been written up numerous times for shitty, shoddy work. Even Boeing had been in a long-running battle with them for turning over shitty product. So for some reason, diversity, equity, and inclusion is to blame for that, and not hedge fund managers firing people, downsizing, and outsourcing. Uh-huh. That's what they want us to believe. And that guy who's supposed to be the richest man in the world. We can change that, you know. Yeah, we can. If he wants this kind of uh, res- response that he is expecting, we'll give it to him. He can be a common citizen or no citizen at all, as a matter of fact. Since this guy wants to get rid of birthright uh, citizenship, this guy wasn't even born here. We can remedy this. Do what they are doing and see how they like it. I know we will never do that, but hey. And then, of course, we got Greg Abbott, a murderer, ordered his National Guard to physically keep Border Patrol from saving a mom and her two kids from drowning in the Rio Grande. Of course, Abbott says, they were already dead. <laughs> Unbelievable. It is so unbelievable how cruel and murderous these tyrants are. And we're going to put up with it. I'm tired of it. And the people who vote them in, I'm not going to give them any respect that they think they deserve. If they feel off put too bad, let's put them off even more. They need to be shunned. We're worried about their response. I'll tell you how you keep from worrying about their response. Punch a Nazi. Now, I'm not saying go out there and physically punch a Nazi. You know what we mean when we say punch a Nazi. Make their lives miserable because they are miserable people. (sighs) Yep. Every Nazi in Germany after World War II said they were not Nazis. They were simply good Germans. Every single one. None of them knew what was going on because they didn't want to know. They knew. They knew. You can't live downwind from a crematorium and not know what's going on. Especially one on a massive industrial scale. Okay. Well, it being a holiday, why don't we just go ahead and forego most of this morning rant that we usually rant on and give you a rundown on what we have in store for you. And at the top, that was Ali Velshi uh, yesterday interviewing a woman who's won the Pulitzer twice for fiction. First black woman. Well, first black person and first woman to win it twice. That says something right there. And they they had a message for, uh, yeah, parents trying to ban her award-winning novel, and they clearly have not read the book. They never do. On the rest of the menu, congressional Republicans are trying to block the Biden administration plan to cut money from the fraudulent crisis pregnancy center scam. More than a dozen states have given themselves the power to override local zoning restrictions blocking large-scale renewable energy projects. That's a good thing. And the National Transportation Safety Board will investigate two crashes involving Florida's Bright Line high-speed train that killed three people at the same railroad crossing. Within days of each other, by the way. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a Belarusian journalist faces up to six years in prison for covering anti-government protests. 
and tens of thousands of Germans demonstrated against the far right. Following that report, extremists will deport even German citizens if they take power. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page to the left from the chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could help us out, we could sure use the help. If you could possibly send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink once a month, it really does help us pay our bills. So please do, as people have been doing for quite some time now. In fact, 14 years. Yeah, we're celebrating a birthday. And uh, we have you to thank for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many, many years ago. So if you could go to that Patreon site, and if you could send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, it really does help. So thank you to those of you who have, and thank you to those of you in advance who are considering possibly doing so in the near future, because we could use the help. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, even Facebook, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those, though. We all take care of the Facebook page, so there. <laughs> Follow me on all those uh, social media platforms, including uh, Tumblr and Instagram. Yeah. And you can do so at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary 10 minutes before showtime. And that way you have access to the actual reportage written by the actual reporters. So you can find those links on the show notes and links diary by following my social media feed. And then you'll have quick access to that. Follow the show on Twitter, such as it is at Cookbook West, and please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. You're just not going to be able to find them on Spreaker. Not anymore. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous River City Hash Mondays is by Amanda Seitz from the Associated Press. In a new twist to the fight over abortion access, congressional Republicans are trying to block a Biden administration spending rule that they say will cut off millions of dollars to anti-abortion counseling centers. That's what they call them. The rule would prohibit fun, uh, states from sending federal funds earmarked for needy Americans to so-called crisis pregnancy centers which counsel against abortions you know like lying at stake are millions of dollars in federal funds that currently flow to the organizations through the temporary assistance for needy families program known as TANF a block grant grant program created in 1996 to give cash assistance to poor children and prevent out of wedlock pregnancies and more than 7,000 comments have been submitted on the proposed rule, which includes a series of restrictions on how states would be able to spend TANF funds. The proposal limiting funds for anti-abortion counseling centers, hey, their crisis pregnancy center scams, is the Biden administration's latest attempt to introduce federal politi policies that expand abortion access. Conservative states, meanwhile, have severely restricted the care since the U.S. Supreme Court stripped women of their federal right to an abortion in 2022. In fact, such severe restrictions that women are dying in ER because we can't give you 
the health care you need because <laughs> because now uh I should mention that these tant funds uh have been misappropriated, and probably the uh best known example would be Tate Reeves giving seventy seven million dollars in tant funds welfare funds to Brett Favre. Ah, I really don't see or hear anybody from the right wing condemning that action. We, Capaletti and John Hanna of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. Clean energy developers had planned a 75-turbine wind farm in mid-Michigan's Montcalm County before local voters shot down the idea in 2022 and recalled seven local officials who had supported it. About 150 miles southeast, Clara Ostrander in Monroe County found herself at the center of a similar conflict as rising medical costs forced her and her husband to consider selling land her family has owned for 150 years. Leasing a parcel to an incoming solar farm could save the property, but neighboring residents complained so vehemently that Ostrander said the township changed its zoning to block the project. There are people in this township I will never, ever speak to again, she said. Local restrictions in Michigan derailed more than two dozen utility-scale renewable energy projects. As of late May, according to a study by the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University, Nationwide, at least 228 restrictions in 35 states have been imposed to stop green energy projects. Huh. I wonder who might be behind that. Michigan and more than a dozen other states are seeking to upend the decision-making process by grabbing the power to supersede local restrictions and allow state authorities to approve or disapprove locations for utility-scale projects. The shift has sparked a political backlash that may escalate as more states seek to simplify getting green energy projects approved and built. Scripps, uh, Michigan joined Connecticut, New York, Oregon, and Minnesota in requiring utility providers to transition to 100% carbon-free electricity generation by 2040. A six-state Rhode Island is shooting for 100% renewable energy by 2033. The goals are consistent with the Biden administration target of carbon pollution-free electricity by 2020 or 2035. But many local officials say giving states the power to cite large-scale energy projects clashes with cherished U.S. political principles. Well, so what? <laughs> I mean, come on. You got Mississippi taking over a whole town that's, well run by a majority black council because they can.
Fasaro of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The NTSB said it will investigate two crashes involving Florida's Brightline train that killed three people at the same railroad crossing on the high-speed train's route between Miami and Orlando. The crashes happened last Wednesday and Friday at a crossing along the U.S. 1 corridor in Melbourne on Florida's Atlantic coast, where the high-speed train passes through on its daily routes to and from South Florida. Since Brightline launched the 160-mile extension that links South Florida and Orlando in September, there have been five deaths. Friday's crash killed driver Lisa Ann Batch. Batch Elder, 52, and passenger Michael Anthony De, Ga- De Gasperi, age 54, both in Melbourne. And on Wednesday, 62-year-old Charles Julian Phillips was killed when the vehicle he was driving was hit by the train. Three passengers in that vehicle were injured. Melbourne Mayor Paul Alfrey told reporters at the scene that the SUV tried to outrun the train. He said he's spoken to Brightline officials about doing another public safety campaign to warn drivers not to go around railroad crossings because the train is traveling at higher speeds. The bright neon yellow trains travel at speeds up to 125 miles per hour in in some locations and the three and a half hour, 235 mile trip between Miami and Orlando takes about 30 minutes less than the average drive. And the NTSB team was expected to be at the scene for several days, which began on Saturday. Uh, now, Brightline, of course, did not immediately respond to an email seeking comment, but the company has placed warning signs near crossings to alert drivers to the fast-moving trains. None of uh, Brightline's previous deaths have been found to be the railroad's fault. Most have been suicides. Pedestrians who tried to cross the tracks ahead of the train or drivers who maneuvered around the crossing gates rather than wait. Yeah, I guess they do have to have a little bit of some public outreach to tell people, do not try to run outrun the train. It won't work. All right, let us get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, first it giveth. After the team of Bloom and Wong gave us last year's surprising entry into the January horror dump category, Megan, expectations were high for director Bryce McGuire's Bloomhouse debut, Night Swim. This time, no creepy dolls or ultraviolence. This one's more from the suburban horror genre, a la Stephen King. Now, the cross into spoiler territory is a bit blurry with these types of movies because part of what makes them what they are is how they do the reveal. It's probably not a spoiler to mention that we're dealing with a haunted swimming pool, but it might be to mention the particular brand of long-standing malevolence that's revealed, unless I already hinted at it. The setup starts off with a perfect American family. The dad, Wyatt Russell, is a pro baseball player dealing with a potential career-ending medical condition. Mom is Banshees of the Inisherin's Carrie Condon, and she's worried. Then there's a son and a daughter and an unfortunate cat. Oh, sorry. Anyway, they move into a place near Minneapolis with the big star of the film, The Pool, which does its thing with some pretty standard tropes. The lights blink with an accompanying electrical buzz when things are happening. Black goo emanates from the afflicted swimmer's facial orifices, that sort of thing. But it's well shot with some deft underwater angles, good transitioning from the sunny and bright to the lurking darkness, 
and there are some neat jump tricks. Veteran Jody Long, in her only scene, tells all in as classic a demented rant as you'll see on screen, worth it even though you'll have probably figured out what's going on by the time it rolls. Box office and critics' responses will probably say more about whether we see a night swim too than the building trade solution we get for an ending. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Imagine for a moment that you're a very hungry bird soaring over 30-foot ocean swells and high winds with no land for thousands of miles. How do you know where you're going? Well, if you're a wandering albatross, you listen. According to a new finding in October's Proceedings of the National Association of Sciences USA, this seabird navigates using sounds below our thresholds for hearing. For Science Quickly, I'm Joseph Polidoro. The wandering albatross thrives in the circumpolar band of ocean north of Antarctica a windswept region that the world's best sailors say has the most inhospitable seas on the planet. On the Southern Ocean's islands where they nest and brood, one wandering albatross parent tends the nest while its partner takes to the sea, traveling as much as 10,000 kilometers as it forages for scattered prey. The bird must eat enough to fuel its turn on the nest, which can be a long time. Birds might go for perhaps a minimum of four or five days, right the way through to up to 30 days. Samantha Patrick is a marine ecologist at the University of Liverpool in England and a co-author of the study. Wandering albatrosses actually gain weight on these long trips because they're extremely efficient flyers. If you've seen an albatross, it's, it's almost never with its wings. Uh, it's quite fascinating to see them flying in the wind. When they're flying, their heartbeat is the same as when they're resting. That's Sophie de Grissac, an ornithologist and a researcher at the French National Museum of Natural History in Paris, who wasn't involved in the study. With their long wingspan, the longest of any bird maxing out at 12 feet, wandering albatrosses use wind, air pressure gradients, and gravity above the swells and waves to soar for thousands of miles, reaching top speeds of 45 miles an hour. Basically, wandering albatrosses don't fly, they soar. And the more distance you cover, um, the more you may find food. The wandering albatross's keen senses of sight and smell help it locate prey. But these senses are good for about 100 kilometers, a distance the bird can travel in as little as an hour and a half. So how does the albatross know where to soar toward? There does seem to be this really um, large gap in information that they're able to access. A clue came in a chance encounter on the way to the Crozet Islands part of the French Southern and Antarctic territories, where Samantha was headed to study albatrosses. On the same vessel were some researchers from the UN, and they were going to work with the hydrophone station that's used there. And that hydrophone station is used to monitor nuclear tests, and it also gathers infrasound data, like the data that we had freely available to us. And we came up with the question of whether seabirds could use infrasound, and um, it was clear that no one had really thought about this before or looked into it before. And that's where the idea for the project came from. Infrasound is any sound below 20 hertz, where human hearing starts to drop off. At the very low end of the infrasound spectrum are microbaroms, very low frequency sounds between 0.1 and 0.6 hertz that are detectable across thousands of miles. Microbaroms are generated by the collision of ocean waves. Natasha Gillies is a seabird ecologist at the University of Liverpool and a co-author of the study. The constant hum of microbaram infrasound is called the voice of the sea. It's present everywhere, all the time, but it's unevenly distributed. Where you have um, more energy in the ocean system because you have wavier areas or windy areas, then you get louder microbaram regions. Ideal soaring conditions for wandering albatrosses. But it also gives them information about standing ocean waves. And this is often caused by things like storms. So it would enable birds to try and 
gauge where storms are potentially. Um, and so this might be because they want to move towards windier areas that could be optimal, or they might want to move away from windy areas if they're too strong and they want to try and avoid storms. Directly testing this apex predator's hearing is not an option. So Natasha and her colleagues arrived at a creative experimental solution. Get a large enough sample of wandering albatross flight paths. Then, using wind and infrasound data, create a sound map of the total flight area, a map of microbaroms across space and time. Send out another set of albatrosses equipped with sensors to field check the sound map. And finally, overlay the bird's flight paths on the sound map. So essentially what we can get is if you put an albatross at point X in space and on this day and time, what infrasound would it be likely to hear and experience? We didn't have an expectation at the beginning that they would move towards louder or quieter areas. What the team found is that wandering albatrosses aren't exactly wandering. Instead, they seem to use microbaroms to head toward ideal wind conditions. Looking at the, the soundscape, and how the birds move, almost following this wave of sound. Uh, I, I found that beautiful. Uh, my name is uh, Francesco Ventura, and I'm a postdoc at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He wasn't involved in the study either. It's another world. That's the thing. It's something that we, we cannot fully understand, I think, because we are humans, and we just we cannot even imagine how that would work for us. But it seemed to be working fine for them, because they've been doing it for a long time. They seem to be able of reading uh, what's going on and of kind of orienting towards that. You know, that's something that is, uh, it's sci-fi. We know that there is something about infrasound that they want to move towards, that, that they like, that is beneficial to them in some way. It was kind of a badly needed paper at this point because it sheds some new light into a fundamental question that is uh, at the core of a lot of uh, marine megafauna research in general, but also uh, at the core of seabird research, which is how do they manage to find food in such a vast area? This reliance on infrasound may actually extend to other species too. Most seabirds are highly dependent um, on wind for movement. It seems to be um, involved in animal behavior in a lot of contexts and a lot of different species. They include whales, elephants, pigeons, and peacocks. So I would be very surprised if this was um, in any way unique to wandering albatrosses. So albatrosses had a very long time to evolve ways of feeling the environment, lots of way they can perceive what's around them. And I think because they really need this condition, this stormy condition, this winds, and so on, it makes perfect sense that it would have evolved more than one way of, of finding them. I think it's a really Nice reminder of the, the different sources of information animals might be using, especially in this sort of environment that is so featureless and how animals can still extract so much information and, and context out of that, despite there seemingly not being much there. Evolution in animals is always, almost always very surprising. Uh, when we study evolution and when you study animal um, closely, you find remarkable things, remarkable inventions. Science Quickly is produced by Tulika Bose and Jeff Delvecchio. Our music is composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Science Quickly wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, give us a rating or review. For Science Quickly, I'm Joseph Polidoro. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Arthritis is common among veterans. Traumatic and overuse injuries during active duty are risk factors for developing arthritis. Fortunately, there are low-cost or no-cost strategies that can help veterans manage arthritis. Physical activity can reduce pain and improve function. It can also help improve mood and play a role in managing other chronic conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. You can do low-impact activities, such as walking, biking, swimming, and water aerobics, all good forms of exercise. Arthritis-specific classes can help you get started. Information on classes, 
exercise programs and tools are available at cdc.gov slash arthritis. These resources can help reduce pain and improve function. Learning self-management techniques can help all veterans become more active, improve their overall quality of life, and thrive. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Hartman, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. When we people of a certain age were kids, boys mostly, spelling out M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I was pretty funny. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute but not so much today. In August 2023 in Senatobia, Mississippi, a 10-year-old boy, third grader Quintavius Eason, was sitting in his mother's parked car waiting for her to return from a nearby building. Quintavius had to pee. Then he really had to pee, but he couldn't find a public restroom. And then he had to pee. So he opened the car door, turned his back to the road, and discreetly relieved himself. A police officer who saw the boy went inside the building to get his mother, who came out and scolded her son. Mom thought the situation was over. But then, four more police officers arrived at the scene of the crime, including a lieutenant who had Quintavious transported to the police station, where he was locked in a cell and charged with being a child in need of supervision. In court, the prosecutor demanded probation with conditions, random drug testing, probation officer meetings, a curfew, and so on. The boy's lawyer rejected the plea deal. And in late 2023, the case was headed to trial, unless the charges were dropped. Two additional facts. The 10-year-old is black, and all the cops are white. Are you surprised? The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. On May 9, 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in Kings Tree, South Carolina, about the importance of voting on the eve of a state primary. Here are his words. Let us march on ballot boxes until somehow we will be able to develop that day. Men will have food and material necessities for their bodies freedom and dignity for their spirits, education and culture for their minds. Let us march on ballot boxes until men and women will no longer walk the streets in search for jobs that do not exist. Let us march on ballot boxes until the empty stomachs of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, Louisiana, and South Carolina to feel. Let us march on ballot boxes until brotherhood is more than a meaningless word at the end of a prayer, but the first order of business on every legislative agenda. Let us march on ballot boxes. We've linked to more of Dr. King's speech archived at the University of South Carolina's Moving Image Research Collections at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1941. That was the day that black labor leader A. Philip Randolph issued a call for a march on Washington. He proposed the march to bring attention to the employment discrimination faced by African-American workers. World War II was being waged across the globe. U.S. industries were booming. Tanks, planes, weapons, and munitions rolled off production lines. 
From 1941 to 1945, the United States would export more than $32 billion in goods as part of its Lend-Lease program to Allied forces. It was also becoming more and more likely that the U.S. itself would enter the fighting soon. Thousands and thousands of workers found employment as demand for labor soared. The young aircraft industry saw a staggering growth of more than 13,000% during the war. But many black workers found themselves shut out of many segments of this growing economy. The Lockheed Aircraft Corporation, to take one example, had zero black workers on their assembly lines in 1941. A. Philip Randolph had risen to national prominence with his successful organizing of the Black Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union. Now he turned his attention to war industry discrimination. He declared, Negro America must bring its power and pressure to bear upon the agencies and representatives of the federal government to exact their rights in national defense employment and the armed forces of this country. He continued, I suggest that 10,000 Negroes march on Washington, D.C. with the slogan, we loyal Negro Americans demand the right to work and fight for our country. His declaration helped to launch a movement. His call for 10,000 marchers grew to a call for 100,000. The threatened march successfully pressured President Roosevelt to issue an executive order to desegregate war production. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 38 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the low 50s, a bit cooler than what we had yesterday. Had quite a bit of rain on Saturday and then somewhat of a drying out yesterday and a bit more drying out today. Mostly cloudy early, then sunshine for the afternoon with winds light and variable. Then clear to partly cloudy overnight with lows near freezing, winds light and variable. And then showers early tomorrow, becoming a steady rain later on in the morning and throughout the day. Highs in the low 40s, winds light and variable, and we're expecting about a half an inch of rain. And much more coming through for the remaining of the week. Looks like pollen is rated as none here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 28 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is low at level 1. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.23 inches. Visibility is less than a half mile, and relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 36 degrees and fair. Paris is 35 degrees and partly cloudy with a potential disruption due to snow and ice. Rome is 56 and clear. Bagram is 40 degrees and clear. Kiev is 28 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 66 and fair. Tokyo is 38 and clear. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 72 degrees and fair. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is minus 3 degrees and... And what? Minus three degrees and bitterly cold. And they do have a wind chill warning for Chicago. And New York, New York 
is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, cloudy with a winter weather advisory. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Juris Carmenau of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. A Belarusian journalist went on trial Friday on charges linked to his professional work covering protests, the latest move in a relentless government crackdown on dissent. Photojournalist Alexander Zyanku faces up to six years in prison if convicted on charges of participation in an extremist group at Minsk City Court. Such uh, accusations have been widely used by authorities to target opposition members, civil society activists, and independent journalist. Zyanku has been in custody since his arrest in June. And his health has deteriorated behind bars, according to the Independent Belarusian Association of Journalists. A total of 33 Belarusian journalists are currently in prison, either awaiting trial or serving sentences. Belarusian authorities have cracked down on opponents of authoritarian President Alexander Lukashenko after huge protests triggered by the August 2020 election that gave him a sixth term in office. The balloting was viewed by the opposition and the West as fraudulent. Protests swept the country for months, bringing hundreds of thousands into the streets. More than 35,000 people were arrested. Thousands were beaten in police custody. And hundreds of independent media outlets and non-governmental organizations were shut down and outlawed. More than 1,400 political prisoners remain behind bars, including leaders of opposition parties and the renowned human rights advocate and 2022 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Alice Bialatsky. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout Staff at the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Tens of thousands of people gathered in Germany yesterday, Sunday, for demonstrations against the far right, among them Chancellor Olaf Scholz and his foreign minister, following a report that extremists recently met to discuss the deportation of millions of immigrants, including German citizens, if they took power. There were reports in Potsdam, just outside Berlin, and at the Brandenburg Gate in the German capital. They followed a demonstration on Saturday in the western city of Duisburg. Schultz and Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock represent the Potsdam area in the German parliament, and Baerbock told German news agency DPA that she attended the demonstration there as one of thousands of locals who stand for democracy and against old and new fascism. Last week... Media outlet Corrective reported on the far-right meeting in November, which is said was attended by figures from the extremist identitarian movement and from the far-right alternative for Germany party, or AFD. 
A prominent member of the Identitarian movement, Austrian citizen Martin Sellner presented his remigration vision for deportation. Potsdam Mayor Mike Schubert said that these plans are reminiscent of the darkest chapter of German history. AFD has sought to distance itself from the meeting, saying it had no organizational or financial links to the event. Members who apparently intended did so in a purely personal capacity and was not responsible for what was discussed there. The Fuhrer has prompted some calls for Germany to consider seeking to to ban AFD, which has moved steadily to the right since its founding in 2013. Many of its opponents have spoken out against the idea, arguing that the process would be lengthy. Success is highly uncertain, and it could benefit the party by allowing it to portray itself as a victim. Sounds familiar, huh? AFD is currently second in the national polls behind the mainstream center-right opposition and ahead of the parties in the center-left Schultz's unpopular coalition. Germany faces the European Parliament election in June and then state elections in September in three eastern regions where AFD is very strong. Those include Brandenburg, where Potsdam is located. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow. Right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver